We're in, uh, in Romans chapter 8 this morning, and uh, we're reading verses 31 to 39. So if, uh, if you would, give ear to the reading of God's Word. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Um, And I'd, I'd love it if you please join me in prayer, would you? Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this gospel declaration. Thank you for what it means for our lives. We ask now for application. Lord, give us understanding for sure. But give us faith to believe, faith to trust, faith to, Lord, live out your call on our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, so we're, um, we're continuing this morning in, uh, in Romans and this series that, that we've called Gospel Peace. And the reason that we've called it Gospel Peace is really that the, the fact that, um, is that, is that my good sign? You getting, <laughs> is, there's not one, that's the joke, right? <laughs> so, um, but, you know, the, the thing about it is that we call it a gospel peace because there really is no peace apart from the gospel. That is, there's no peace apart from being restored to God, being, being made right with God. As long as there is separation, as long as there's enmity between us and God, we're, we're never really going to be at peace. It doesn't matter what we can get from this world, what we can set up for ourselves, what we can do, accomplish. It just, it really doesn't matter. The only true and lasting peace is peace in Jesus Christ. And the truth is, if you have that, you really have everything. There, there is nothing in this world that, that can, can ultimately destroy that peace that we have in Jesus. And so we call this gospel peace. And and the thing that we're doing this morning in, in Romans 8 here is we're focusing in on, I think the, the, the best way to say it is the, the application of gospel logic, of gospel thinking, uh, the application of gospel truth to our lives, to the things that we face, uh, so that applying the gospel truth to our lives, we're actually able to live in the peace that Jesus wants for us, Right? And I just just give you an example from Jesus himself. He does this in the Gospels. Uh, he calls upon us to apply gospel logic, our, our knowledge of the love of God to, and, and in this specific case in Matthew chapter 6, specifically to our worry about everyday life, right? So he's asking us to think about our worry in light of his great love for us. So listen to what he says. Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? You you see what he's doing there? He's he's pressing us, think according to the love of God for you, right? He's pressing us to gospel logic. You know, there are lots of folks who will say about the faith, especially about the Christian faith, that, that faith is about not thinking, right? 
And I'm sure you've heard this, right? That people say, oh, well, you know, if you're going to go to church, you've got to like check your, your brain at the door. You can't think. This is about not thinking. And, and honestly, nothing could be further from the truth. This is, all, right? <laughs> this is all about having the knowledge of God and right thinking. He doesn't want us to stop thinking. What the Lord wants us to do is to stop thinking according to the deception of the world. The Lord wants us to think with hearts and minds that are enlightened by the Holy Spirit. The Lord wants us to think according to the truth that's been revealed. He wants us to think according to the truth of the gospel, not the deceptions of the world, right? So it's not about not thinking, it's about right thinking. It's about applying the truth of the gospel to, uh, to our lives. And, and so when we get to Paul then, he makes this statement at, at the beginning of our scripture today, uh, what then shall we say about such wonderful things as these? It's really another way of saying what does this mean to our lives, right? How, how do we apply this? What does this mean to what we're actually facing day to day? What shall we say about all of this gospel truth in terms of our lives? And, and so um, I, I want to I ask you to remember, too, that we're in this kind of mini-series from Romans 8. We've been focused now for three weeks on Romans 8. We've read the whole thing now in, in three installments. And, um, and the reason we've done this is that it is just this beautiful, compact declaration of the gospel and what it means for our lives. So when, when Paul says here, such wonderful things, we know what he's talking about because it's in the beginning of Romans 8, right? All that we've been reading in Romans 8 up to this point, that's actually the wonderful things that he's talking about. How do we apply these wonderful things? What wonderful things? Well, first of all, at the beginning of Romans 8, you read, we read, there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. So the first wonderful thing, what do we do about this? What do we say about it? How do we apply it to our lives? That first wonderful thing is that there's no condemnation. There is a stability. There is a permanence. There is a grounding for your salvation. And that grounding is not you getting everything just right. Praise God. That grounding is in what? The fact that you gave your life to Jesus Christ, that you now belong to him. That is the foundation of your salvation and mine, right? That's a wonderful thing. He goes on to talk about the freedom and the life we have because of the gift of the Holy Spirit, that we don't have to live in bondage and slavery to sin. We can live in the freedom of the Spirit of the living God, right? Praise God. That is a wonderful thing. Not only that, the Lord declares in Romans chapter 8 through Paul that this identity, this new identity that we have, that in fact we are adopted as children of God. That's who you are if you're in Christ Jesus. You are a child of God. And he even goes so far as to explain, and we, it's like we know this, we felt this, those who are in Christ, but he puts words to it that the Spirit of, of God, his Spirit, witnesses to our spirit that we are his children. The spirit fills our hearts with his love, declares to us, you know what? You belong to me. You are my son. You are my daughter, right? That's a wonderful thing. And not only that, we can, we can keep going in Romans chapter 8 that there is, this, there is this promise of the renewal of all things. Do you remember this? And of the glory to come, that the wrong that is so strong in the world right now, it will not always be. Christ will return, and he will make all things new. He will restore all of creation. And he, by the way, is going to give you a new body. Praise God, right? We received this promise when we first believed. He will give us a resurrected body. Not only that, you can keep going, and you see that in the meantime... The Holy Spirit helps us. You remember that? We talked about that the Holy Spirit, he helps us. He helps us. Part of what he helps us to understand is that there is a plan that's being worked out in our lives, a plan to make us more and more like Jesus, a plan whereby God is actually working all things together, all of the stuff, the good stuff, the bad stuff. He's working it all together for our good, right? And so there's all these amazing things that he tells us. And then he says, so what, are we, what should we say about all this? How is it that we're going to apply this? And the first thing that I want to, I want to ask you to look at with me is, is that this, this first bit of sort of gospel logic that God wants us to apply to our lives is the fact that God is for us. God is not against you. God's not trying to catch you in something. God's not looking for a loophole in your salvation. God is actually for you, fully 100% 
for you. The scripture says, if God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all. <laughs> While I read this, I want, would you notice how many times you see for us? Just, just notice, for us. It says, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one, for God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one, for Christ Jesus died for us, was raised to life for us, and is sitting at, in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. Right? I actually count them six times in seven sentences. God says through Paul, I am for you. I am for you. I am actually on your side. And that's really important, I would imagine. If you're, a, if you're a first century Christian in Rome, you're in the most powerful empire that the world has ever known, and that empire, by the way, is against you. These persecutions would break out, and oh my goodness. And, and listen, Christians were killed for entertainment, diabolical entertainment. Christians were killed as a matter of political expediency, just as plain old hatred. Christians were, were, were being tortured, pressed to renounce Christ. And even if all of that isn't happened to you, the culture, the society actually persecutes you socially and economically, right? And so all, all of society is lined up, what? Against you. How valuable then is it to apply gospel logic to your life. You know what? All of this, all of these might be against me, and yet, and yet God is for me. You know, I, I, don't, think, I don't think I ever really felt the full weight of Romans chapter 8, and maybe I haven't even still, but maybe I never felt the full weight of Romans chapter 8 until we got to go on a, a, a journey, um, a, a Journeys of Paul pilgrimage. And we actually got to go to Rome, right? And we, we go to this church of St. Sebastian, right? And, uh, and we're learning about him, that he was a part of the Roman military, and he came to faith in Jesus Christ. And, and after he came to faith in Jesus Christ, they wanted to force him to renounce Christ. But he wouldn't do it. And, and they executed him, and they... There's actually like a statue of him. The way they executed him is they shot him with all these arrows, just innumerable arrows, right? And then we go down in the catacombs, and you're thinking about all these Christians who have been laid to rest there, persecuted Christians, and, and, and you're thinking about the fact that so many times the, the Christians were forced to actually worship down in, in the catacombs as a, a, because here's the thing about the Romans. They didn't think about their mortality, Right? They didn't want to think about their death. So they, like they'd send their servants down to the catacombs, but they didn't want to go down there. And so there'd be this place of safety where they could actually gather and they could worship. And, and so, you know, like one of the, one of the inscriptions that, that I, I read about doing some research on the catacombs, man, this five-year-old girl who had passed, her name was Aprononian, Aprononia. And there was an inscription on her tomb. You know what it said? It says, Aprononia, you believed in God, you will live in Christ. And so to think about the faith that they had as they worshiped God, and um, man, and then, so we went in this, this chapel on one side of the church, and, and we start reading Romans 8, and I, I can't even get through it. I'm getting tears all over my Bible. Just to think about this reality that God is speaking over their lives. All of Rome might be against you, but there is no one like our God. There might not be, have ever been an empire like Rome before, but there is no one like our God. He created all that is seen and unseen. He is the source of all light and life and power. There is no power in this world that's not derivative of God. There's no one more mighty than God. There's no one like him. He holds the universe together. Our God is from everlasting to everlasting. And by the way, where is the Roman Empire today? And where is Caesar today, right? Only one I know is a little Caesar, <laughs> right? And he makes, like, it's not even good pizza. It's like, right? Where is Rome? Where is Caesar 
But not only that, I want to ask you to see, because the Lord wants us to see this, to see the extent to which he is for us. He did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. You know, there's an expression now, and and I I don't mean to be trite about this, but I think it applies. You know, you could say that you're all in, right? Well, in terms of how God is for you, he is all in, all in for you. The Father sent His own Son, His only Son, the Son of God, second person of the Trinity of God Almighty, stepped out out of heaven. He emptied Himself. That's what the Bible says. He emptied Himself of His divine privilege, and He humbled Himself to take on the form of a slave, humbled Himself even to the point of death on a cross. He lived a perfect life, and He took our sins upon Himself that we might live. This is the extent to which God is for us. And so, you know, the truth is, and I hope this isn't true, but the truth is there might not actually be anybody in this whole world that is for you. It could be true that everybody, literally everybody in this world is against you, accuses you, condemns you, is not pulling for you, is rooting against you, rooting for your failure. That could be true. I hope it's not. But it could be true, and yet, and yet, you could still live in the peace of this truth that God himself is for you. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. And then and then I also want to ask you to see this gospel logic God wants to keep applying to our lives that God's love is unshakable. You understand that, right? That God's love is unshakable. And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Now, if you would, let's just confess, first of all, that this sounds really great. But what I, want, what, I want to, what I want to make sure that you know is that this is not just like um, p- poetic sentimentality, right? This is not just words that sound good and, and are just about feelings. This isn't just that God has positive feelings toward you that nobody could take away. This is far deeper than that. What we're talking about is God's love. It is an indestructible powerful force that binds you to God. The loves of this world are only a pale reflection of the love of God that holds you. Ask, you could ask him, ask my wife, ask my girls, if my love for them does not come with a claim, if my love doesn't come with power, with provision, I would step in front of a bullet for any of them, right? And I know I'm not alone in this room, amen? They know that my love is not just feelings. And I, by the way, in case you don't know this, am just a man and not (laughs) and a flawed one. And yet that's true of my love for them. How true is that of God's love for you? What would would he not do for you? His, His love for you is unshakable. It's like, it's almost like there's a banner over you that declares his love. There is a radical claim upon your life that you belong to him. He's called you by name. He's redeemed you. And he says, this one, this one is mine. And there's nothing and no one that's going to change that. Not for all of eternity, nothing is going to change that. He, friends, will never, ever let you go. And and finally, friends, um, I want to ask you to look at this gospel logic that, that declares that overwhelming victory is ours, right? The scripture says, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things... Overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Now, this literally says, what's translated here, overwhelming victory, literally, Greek to English, it says, super victor or super conqueror. You are a super conqueror. Now, I have a question because this seems like a really weird statement, right? Given the sentence before it, 
that says, according to scriptures, that, <laughs> that Christians are being persecuted, that they are being killed every day like sheep to the slaughter. How do you say that sentence? And then in the immediately following sentence, declare we are super victors. To me, that sounds a lot like defeat, like a lot like it. It seems like super defeat. How, how could that be so? And, and this is intentional. Paul is an amazingly brilliant guy. He doesn't put these two sentences together. The Holy Spirit doesn't put these two sentences together unless it is intentional. And of course, this all comes down to how it is that we could be super conquerors. It all comes down to what the battle is, right? It all actually comes down to what the goal, what the prize is, what it is that we're trying to win. If, in fact, for those early Christians, and we could say this about us today, too, if, in fact, the goal is acceptance, if the goal is approval from the culture, they lose, and so do we. But that wasn't the goal. If the goal was mere physical survival, right? the preservation of our physical bodies. If that was their goal, they lose. And by the way, eventually we all lose that way. And so it couldn't have been those things, right? There must be another battle. And, and friends, it all hinges on this. The Lord has declared, the Lord has declared that the goal, the goal, the prize is Jesus Christ and life in him. It is salvation. That's what we're fighting for. That's who we want. That's our prize. Our goal and prize is Jesus and life in him. The promise of salvation in this life is that we would know Jesus Christ dwelling in our hearts through faith, that we would know his presence, his provision, his plan, his purposes in our lives, that we would have in this life what's called abundance in Jesus Christ, life to the full. That's the promise of salvation in Jesus. And in the life to come, his promise is that even though we die, and we know that we do, even though we die, yet we shall live. That in fact, we will step fully into the love that we have only tasted of now. We will step into his presence and we shall live. And there is nothing, Paul declares, that anybody can do to take that away from us. So we are already conquerors. It has already been achieved on the cross of Jesus Christ. You have already received it by faith given to you by God. Do you see? You are already a conqueror through Jesus Christ who loves you. And so, and so, the true battle then, friends, the true battle is not a physical battle, a battle of flesh and blood. The true battle is a spiritual battle. And there is an enemy of our souls, and he prowls around, the scripture says, and we know this is true, he prowls around looking for someone to devour. This enemy of our souls, he wants us to give up. He wants us to renounce Christ. And short of that, he wants to neutralize our impact for the kingdom of God. Our enemy, the enemy of our souls, wants to rob us of the joy of the Lord. He wants to steal the peace of Jesus Christ. He wants us to be distracted, discouraged, de dejected, deceived, afraid, ashamed, out of the fight. That's what he wants. And he schemes. He schemes to break friendships, especially holy friendships and marriages apart. He schemes to break churches apart by quarreling and by false teaching. But as we read in 1 John chapter 4, 4, but you belong to God. You belong to God, my dear children. You have already, do you hear this? You've already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. I imagine right now that there are many of us who feel dejected, who feel defeated. It may be that you are in the throes of illness. It may be that grief and depression and discouragement is pressing you down. It might be that there is an uncertainty that has you so worried that your stomach is in knots. It might be that the enemy of your soul is accusing you right now trying to make you ashamed of a sin that the Lord has already forgiven and forgotten. There might be any number of reasons that you feel defeated right now, but the Lord has declared that you are already a victory 
a victor according to the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You know, I, I love this, um, this declaration um, in Zechariah. I'm, I might be the only one, but I think this is really cool. Um, in the book of the prophet Zechariah, there's this declaration in chapter 3 and verse 2 that essentially Paul says in Romans 8, yeah, yeah, this was pointing toward Jesus, and now in him it's fulfilled. I love this declaration because you got to see the scene, right? you got to picture it in your mind. Satan is there, and he's saying, oh, you know this Jeremy guy. Did you see what he did? Do you know about his sin? I accuse him. That's, what, that's who Satan is. He's the accuser of the brethren, right? That's who he is. And so you got to see the scene, right? He's accusing, he's accusing. Now listen to this. And the Lord said to Satan, I, the Lord, reject your accusations, Satan. Yes, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebukes you. This man is like a burning stick that has been snatched from the fire, right? <laughs> Satan might be accusing you right now, but by the word of God, he, <laughs> he is rebuking Satan. He's saying, uh-uh. I don't accept any of your accusations. They've all been covered by the cross of Jesus Christ. I have plucked this one from the flames of judgment, and this one is mine. You're not going to touch this one. That is, that is the victory of Jesus Christ over your sin. Who dares to accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who will then condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us, was raised to life for us, and he is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand pleading for us. Do you understand that's what he's doing right now? Right now, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, is pleading for you. He is, according to Hebrews, he is actually, he lives, he lives to intercede for you. Understand, Lord, the, what the Lord is showing us by his gospel, how he wants to apply gospel truth again and again to our lives so that we can live in his peace. And may it be so in Christ's holy name. Amen. 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 Let's pray. Um, God, we thank you. We thank you for the gospel. We know that we are lost, that we would never have peace or rest unless, Lord, you would do this for us, and you have done it, and you've given us this way of peace with you, of being made right with you. And so, Lord, enable us to receive anyone here who has never received you, Lord, to say yes to you, to, to open their hearts to receive you, Lord Jesus, as Lord and Savior of their lives. And Lord, would you, for those of us who have, would you enable us by your Spirit to continually apply gospel truth to our lives that we might live in the peace of Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen.